Attention crew, this is your Captain Caliban speaking. This is a supplemental episode of Enterprising Individuals, where we bring you news and tidbits from the world of Trek, also interviews with special guests, and a few little surprises along the way. And we've got a very special guest for you this week, and we'll get right to that in just a little bit. In the meantime, I hope you're well, and I hope that you're still coping mentally and socially and economically with the stay-at-home order and the lifestyle changes that the COVID-19 outbreak has brought about. I never thought that I would be reporting to you on your handheld device over a global digital network about the updates concerning the world-sweeping plague, but, you know, sometimes dystopia sneaks up on you. It's weird to think that we are living through a historic event, an historic event, something like, you know, the flu pandemic of the late uh, 19-teens. It's like 100 years ago. Um, And everything is history, I guess, but some things are in the overview of the history book, and some are chapters in the book. And this feels like a chapter, I have to say. Uh, I'm a little sick of history, and honestly, I need a break. And when I need a break, one of my escapes is music. I love music, music of just about any genre. Like a lot of music fans, my most prized possession in college was my wall of CDs. Uh, Those are all MP3s now, for the most part, uh, with a little bit of vinyl on the side. But I'm still obsessed with discovering new bands and collecting music. But some bands have decided to do the discovering themselves. Boldly Go is a Star Trek-themed punk band from Charleston, West Virginia. They write and perform real-deal punk music about Star Trek and sci-fi themes. And their debut single, First Contact, is available right now to listen to and to purchase on their Bandcamp site and on YouTube. I got a chance recently to sit down with Foz Rotten, the frontman for Boldly Go, and we talked about all things Star Trek and musical. You might assume that punk would be unnecessary in the 24th century. After all, if the Federation has everything figured out, what good are some anarchists screaming about the government? But in Foz's opinion, in the future, punk will be more important than ever. We also talk about the times that music has shown up on screen in Star Trek. It's less than you'd think. Uh, the fact that almost every Trek character plays an instrument. Plus, we rate the TV Trek themes. We talk about which series is which band and more. And that's coming up right now. I'll be back at the end of the show to tell you where you can find out more about Boldly Go. Plus, you'll be hearing some of Boldly Go's debut single, First Contact, in the show transitions. Enjoy the interview. Hey ho, let's go. And with that, let's get underway. My guest on the show today is Foz Rotten. Foz is a singer and performer and the front man for Boldly Go, a Star Trek punk rock band for the next generation. He's also a podcaster and the co-host of Love Plus Us, a geek-tinged lifestyle and relationship podcast. Boldly Go's debut single, First Contact, is available now at boldlygoband.bandcamp.com. Foz, welcome to the show. Uh, Thank you so much for having me today. It's great to have you here. Uh, I always ask first-time guests to the show how they first discovered Star Trek. How did you become a Star Trek fan? Well, I'm I'm one of the TNG babies. Uh, mm-hmm. I was born back in the 80s, and whenever uh, TNG was doing all the, the first airing and then into the, the reruns and everything, I, I would go to sleep by it. Uh, <laughs> I would set my schedule. I think it would come on at like 9 o'clock, and I would beg my mother to stay up late enough to to watch it at least partly uh of the you know part of the way through yeah. before i fell asleep and everything and then after that you know the reruns of the the original series all the movies were were rented and then uh i remember watching the premiere of deep space nine and voyager and all the way through yeah it's really amazing to have such access to that now like if you were just you yeah. know a kid now you could just reach all of that stuff the whole history of Star Trek and like I feel bad for fans of things like Doctor Who which has you know an even longer history than Star Trek but it's just so tough to find some of that old stuff if you yeah. really wanted to dig back into the old uh, doctors now, I remember saving up money from like birthdays and Christmas and stuff and having to dish out the 20 plus dollars at, uh, at music and movie stores for like the VHS of two episodes of Star Trek. On. Yeah, two, you get two whole episodes, but in good quality, though. Yeah. <laughs> and like, ooh, this one has Wesley on the cover. Maybe this will be good. <laughs> oh, hope springs eternal. Uh, I guess I guess you should tell us, too. How did you, how'd you get into music? 
Oh, uh, well, that's the two passions in my life have always been uh, music and punk rock, you know, and uh, and Star Trek and movies. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, like I music ever since I was real little, especially going into into punk rock, um, you know, kind of like my preteens. I just that was. The guys with mohawks always look cool in 80s movies, and you know, the, the music always sounded good. Uh, you know, if you go back and listen to a, a lot of the stuff I watched at early age, everything, you know, from Star Trek IV to Crocodile Dundee and Robocop, it always had, you know, punkers in it looking like the bad guys. Right. It was kind of in, intriguing. And then, like, you know, you hear the music uh, in some places, like Circle Jerks gets played in Police Academy movies. Like, okay. <laughs> weird random stuff and it, it pulled me towards it and once i figured out what it was i just ran with it um and star trek you know like i said since i was a little kid so it's only natural that now i've combined the two i have to say that as far as punk goes you know i'm familiar with like the classic bands like the ramones and the sex pistols and black flag but i'm not really well acquainted with modern punk acts what's the state of punk in the 21st century well we uh it's i mean it's alive and well it's very very sub mm -hmm. um you, I mean, and that's with every uh, you know music genre. That's you know metal is very subgenre, and punk is very subgenre. Um, it you know I, I just say that Boldly Go is just a punk rock band. As in, we can go street punk, we can uh, do a folk punk song if we want. You know, <laughs> sure. Ramones Core is a style that a lot of uh, bands um, do these these days, where it's very more distorted, fast driven Ramones style. Um, but overall, I just call it punk rock. I love everything. Um, now that, that being said, I think a lot of people, uh, you know, in their late twenties or early thirties, have been in the scene for a long time. They kind of feel like me and they're like, man, it's all just punk rock. It's all just rock and roll. It's all just fun. Yeah. It's, you know, you, you can sub genre nitpick to death, but at the end of the day, it's, it's all just good and fun. Yeah, and of course, Boldly Go is a part of that movement. And like you said, you're a Trek fan, you're a punk guy, so Star Trek punk band follows, I guess. How did Boldly Go come together? Uh, Star Trek punk rock. Um, well, like I was saying, uh, I listen to a lot of um, you know punk rock every day, and a lot of the Ramones core bands kind of have a have a theme. Uh, my buddies uh, in the band, the Jasons, is definitely a band to check out. They are a Ramones Core style band uh, that are Friday the 13th Jason themed, where they look like the Ramones, <laughs> but they wear the Jason hockey mask. Okay, cool. <laughs> and, and so I was listening to them one day. I was listening to Teenage Bottle Rocket one day, and I was like, man, all this stuff's genre. And I, I'm good friends with um, horror punk bands as well. My, my best friend grown up uh, is Zach, the lead singer of The Big Bad. They're a horror punk where, you know, everything's kind of misfitsy. You know, everything's about a horror movie. Right. Everything's genre driven. I'm like, there's not much sci-fi punk. There's not much. And there's not Star Trek punk per se. You know, of course, there's Five Year Mission and Warp 11 bands like that. That's Star Trek rock and roll. Yeah. But there wasn't, you know, the the punk rock version of it. And I was like, how is, I started thinking about it. I was like, how is this not a thing? How, how has this not been done to the nth degree of punk rock? And I started looking, I was like, you know what? I'm doing it. That's all there is to it. And <laughs> I formed the band and here we are a year later, our first singles out albums on the way. Things are going really well. Yeah, it's it's funny because you think of the way that punk has become shorthand in literature, like uh, cy uh, cyberpunk or steampunk and that sort yeah. of thing. And I, when I think back, I can't really think of any like sci-fi themed punk bands from like the first wave or any real successive wave of punk and bands. Are there any sci-fi punk bands? There have been some that dabbled in it. Yeah. If if you look up the hashtag, because I'm a nerd and I've done this, if you look <laughs> up the hashtag sci-fi punk, you'll find some bands that might have like a synthesizer or something in it, but like no band that has actually really just took it and ran with it. Yeah. I want to see, you know, you know, H.R. Geiger type set dressing. I want to see big <laughs> stuff, you know, and that's on a grand scale. But, you know, we're, what we're doing is the, the more straight ahead punk rock, Star Trek infused. Um, I said as a, I said as a joke once, once before, but I kind of actually adopted it as my motto. When I write songs, I kind of just place myself in the world of Star Trek. Mm -hmm. It's, I try to stay away from, we are fans of Star Trek singing about Star Trek. I try to place myself in world. Sure. And as, like I said, as a joke one time, I said, 
conceptually boldly go is as if the punk on the bus in Star Trek four got taken into the future instead of the doctor and he formed a punk band. Okay. <laughs> and that's really kind of the standpoint of, I've been writing from. So like I'll write a song about Wrath of Khan, but it's more of, Oh, he's heard of this story and he's telling that story from in world. Yeah. Um, you know, and then there's love songs about like an Andorian girl and stuff. So <laughs> it's not necessarily from him, but I was just saying as jokingly, I was like, yeah, that would actually really work. You just write in world stories and yeah. you can do anything. Yeah. And first contact is your debut single, uh, debuted last yeah. week. Uh, can we expect to hear, uh, that Andorian girl love song uh, coming up soon? Yeah, actually there's uh videos of it out right now. Um, live videos uh and dorian girls the name of the song go check that out okay uh that was one of the first songs we ever wrote um now we have um the con song i was mentioning that's uh that's coming up it's called a uh, nightmare if you look closely there uh, could be some live videos people posted that out okay um so we we've got about 13 songs you know it's it's all coming uh starting out we had um a couple of ramones covers that we did of like um uh, their songs, but with more Star Trekified lyrics, oh, okay. um, like Vulcan Hop and um, Deep Space Bop instead of uh, Blitzkrieg Bop, yeah. and you know, and that that was really fun. But then you know, just like any band starting off, you do a couple covers and start writing your own music. So you know, we kind of put those to the side. Still do them live; they're really fun. They might make the might make the album, but uh, overall, you know, we got uh, ten thirteen original tracks coming. It's, it's been really fun. That sounds great. How are you guys? I mean, we're all dealing with the quarantine in our own way, but how how are you guys dealing with uh, not being able to go out and do dates? Well, you'd have to ask each of the guys in their their own way. I think <laughs> yeah. some of them are a little more restless than others. I'll be honest with you. I'm what they consider an essential personnel in my day job. Okay. Uh, I'm a restaurant manager and we do lots of carry out. So oh, sure. my life is still the same. I work, you know, my yeah. full time plus uh, overtime nowadays uh, day job, and on the weekend I'm still doing the boldly go stuff. Only difference is we're not able to meet for practices and play shows like we want to. Um, now I know a couple of the guys they're able to work from home, and so they're kind of getting a little stir crazy sitting in the house all day. Yeah, um, we we'd love to figure out how to practice uh, over Skype, but it's just. Uh, the lag and everything like that oh, it, yeah, it yeah. wouldn't really be good. But as soon as this is all over, we have um, some shows lined up. Um, some announced uh, September 11th, uh, you know, we'll be in Indianapolis with a five year mission celebrating their 10 year anniversary. Wow. So I'm, I'm real excited about that. I love five year mission. Yeah. The, o, the OG guys. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, that sounds great. Uh, thanks for joining me on the show today. Uh, music is something that has, I think, it's got a unique place in Star Trek. Um, of course, the distinctive themes of Star Trek are a big part of the franchise's appeal. And many of the protagonists of Star Trek shows are themselves musicians. And it's kind of funny because that fact doesn't necessarily have anything to do with anything. It's not like any major wars were ever solved because Harry Kim could jam out on the clarinet. And there, yeah. there isn't even like a close encounter to the third kind moment where we have to hit the right musical tones to communicate with an alien race. And I mean, Star Trek isn't glee, although I'd watch that, but I think <laughs> it's, in, it's important to the people that make Trek to show us that the characters on Star Trek appreciate music and they create it themselves because they're refined, they're cultural people and they're interested in improving themselves which I think is right on the money character wise for citizens of the Federation. Yeah, totally. It's, and it's always like refined classical music or maybe, you know, yeah. like jazz and his trombone yeah. and everything. But you know, you know, Tom Paris is uh, on Voyager in the holodeck, you know, not just doing hot rods and stuff. You know, when he's like working on the hot rod, he's not playing classical music. He's playing, you know, probably 50s uh, rockabilly or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I love the idea that he's a, like a 20th century fan, but being 300 years away from it, it's all sort of compressed into, you know, yeah. just like one sort of thing. So he's got maybe... Um, you know, maybe ACDC on the radio, but he likes 50s Perfect. cars and it's he's yeah. drinking Dr. Pepper. And yeah. <laughs> like, like whenever he's, you know, back in the 90s talking about stuff that's far out and trippy. Yeah. And yeah. Like it's 60s. And it, yeah. It's, he's like know, a walking theme restaurant. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. And so, yeah, he could, t I could totally see him doing some like 80s hair metal or something while oh, working yeah. on a 50s hot rod. Yeah. 
Uh, as far as like plot goes in Star Trek, the music is usually kind of secondary. Like there's an episode of Voyager called Virtuoso where they meet a race yep. that's never heard music and, and they go crazy over the doctor. And of course, there's the beautiful use of music uh, as a character device in the TNG episode, The Inner Light. Um, but probably the most important plot use of music in Star Trek is Star Trek Four, where Kirk and company save the Earth from a probe with a whale song. I thought I thought you were going to say the punk on the bus. But, oh, the know. punk on the bus, yeah, of course, <laughs> and, and that as well. <laughs> but uh, no, yeah, I, I love that because you know it that that movie wears its heart on its sleeve that you know it, yeah. it wants to be the the save the environment movie you know it sure. wants to be an important message but part part of that message is also you know if if you kill off something the song you know the song that that thing makes won't be there to save us yeah you know so you could look into that you know if you're not looking at it from the nature point of view as you know communication don't kill important things that you know need to communicate in this life and whether you know however you take that metaphorically or you know act, literally um it means a lot because like if we don't have music what does that make us just like if they didn't have whales what would that mean yeah and I, you know i don't know about the real world but in the world of the movie you know whales are intelligent essentially like spock can right. talk to them so it's also just appreciating life forms and things that we don't we see as beneath us, but realizing that they're a part of our world, you know, just like anything else. Right. I agree. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah there's so many characters in Star Trek that, that play instruments uh, or, or play music. Uh, some of them are, you know, multi-instrumental uh, like Data or uh, Harry Kim. I think it's um, a couple of them are a little on the nose. Like, of course, Trip plays the harmonica. Of course he does. And, I guess I missed this episode, but I, I found out that uh, Dr. Phlox plays the drums. But when you think about Dr. Phlox's kind of Jimmy Buffett, you know, Hawaiian shirt, like oh. hangout dude sort of thing, yeah. it makes total sense that he plays the drums. He He's totally not, you know, knocking back a couple and uh, listening to Jimmy Buffett. I, I'll tell you that right now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um. it, it, music is extremely important for like a, a, a character like Data for his development, you know, because of his nature, he's technically proficient on pretty much any instrument, but his playing, you know, lacks soul and emotion and it's reflective of his pursuit of humanity. I mean, and that's, that's, he, he submerges himself in literature, in all the fine arts, painting, you know, it's, it's only, you know, it's only right that music would be a part of that. And, yeah. you know, I'm sure Captain Picard, you know, was like, here, Data, listen to this. You know, he was probably making him mixtapes in the 24th century. <laughs> That's you know? what I want to see, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and R Riker one day is like hearing what Picard uh, suggested to him. He's like, no, 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 Data, listen to this. <laughs> this is going to blow your mind, man. Your positronic yeah. brain. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so he just takes it all in. And was I remember the episode where he's like trying to do – a bunch of things all at once and like everything's just running at once all the music's running at once he's doing things so imagine all the music he can listen to at once and pay attention to every little bit of it yeah yeah and yet at the same time he's still got that he doesn't have the ability to sort of like put his soul into something uh, right. at least when we first meet him i, I mean I, when i was in band um like in uh, like high school uh, i remember Almost to the moment, the time that I realized, oh, it's not just about like getting your fingers, you know, on the valves in the right places. Like, you know, you, you need to put your soul into this. Like, what am I trying to express with this? And right. and of course, that was just me learning how to do music. But uh, Data's got this problem where it's like, if you can't feel the emotion, how do you, how do you know how to do that? So so let me ask, because this might go into spoiler territory, but have you watched the uh, season finale of Picard yet? Yes. And I do. I want to talk to you about it. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, because I'm very uh, interested in hearing your take on the song that plays in we'll, – we'll just say this. I won't spoil too much. The last time we see Data. Sure. The, the song that's playing. Do you think that's something that he actually chose to listen to or is it just something playing in the show? Because to me, it came off as this is what Data's listening to in his last scene. Whether it was – 
diegetic that is existing, you know, in the world of the show or so, yeah, just the soundtrack? That's a great question. I think that it can play as both. You know, I think it was probably also meant as both because, again, you know, if you know anything about Data, you know that that song appears uh, in an earlier part of his life. And mm-hmm. the fact that it is uh, sung so beautifully by um, one of the actors on the show. Yeah, I think yeah. it I think that fits. I, I love that they picked that, you know, in, in our world and it suits in world so well. Cause it, it shows that data has grown. It, he has, he has a soul, yeah. you know, he does love, he, you know, just like us, if, if we were all in our last moments, I'm sure we've all thought about, well, what's the last song I want to hear? Just like the last food we're going to eat, you know, all that stuff who yeah. we want to see. Um, and it's not it, something that it's, it's not like, the most tech it's not flight of the bumblebee or something like that that's like technically amazing or something bombastic it's literally something that is nostalgic for him because he performed it himself he remembers it and it's like yeah what is that last thing that i want to hear it's that thing it's something that holds meaning it's like to me my you can ask me my top five favorite songs they change all the time sure but they're not maybe even going to be for my top five favorite artists they are maybe not even my top five favorite albums. They are going to be something that's personal to me that makes me feel something, whatever it is. Could be completely different every time. Yeah. But it it holds a special emotion to me. And I think that's what it was just a little small thing they were trying to do there with Data that, yes, this is something for him. Yeah. One of my favorite uses of music in Trek is uh, when Spock jams out with the hippies in The Way to Eden. Yeah. <laughs> You've got the wacky hippies, and then you got the buttoned-up Spock, but they can still both groove out to space music. And what was his instrument? Was it like a, a harp, or what exactly was his instrument? I've heard it called both a lute and a lyre, which are definitely two different things. Um but yeah, it's like a harp-ish type thing. String and I didn't know if it was supposed to be specifically Vulcan or... Yeah, I think it is Vulcan, yeah. Like, cause I always heard that, but I never, you know, dive too deep into Spock's instrument. Whereas, like, later on, they were just like, okay, you get a trombone, you get a clarinet, right. you get a... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Spock, Spock has uh, his lute, and it's presumably similar to stringed instruments on our planet. And in a lot of ways, like, mus- musical instruments have stayed pretty much the same over, like, the centuries uh, since they've been developed, at least in principle. And I always laugh when I'm watching Star Trek and they've got a future instrument, which is yeah. usually like a colored lucite version of something like the lime green plastic symbols on the drum set in Star Trek oh. Nemesis. Or if you've ever seen um, Starship Troopers when oh. uh, the guy's playing the, the violin, but it's like a future violin. Yep. Uh, <laughs> back, back to the hippies episode. I'm trying to remember. It's been a minute since I watched it, uh, but didn't, like their guitars, weren't they like weird, like two or three strings on like a weird board or something? Yeah, like, the, the main guy had something that I think you would think of as more of a traditional lute or maybe like a shamisen or something like that. It had a really long neck and was like two or three stringed. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, okay, future acoustic guitar hippies. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> They're into acoustic stuff. Yeah. Um, We've got like. Instrumentation has evolved in the last 50 years, probably more than it's ever evolved, you know, with the way people make music and synthesizers, drum machines, electronic music. And we've got AI writing songs now, basically. Like, how do you think in the time from now, in the 21st century to like the 24th century, how do you think music might change over that 300 years? I think like a lot of things, it will be splintered into two factions of and just like today, there's different variations of this of, okay, the, some people just want, don't care. They want poppy catchiness. And if that's done by a computer producer, whatever, take the um, human, you know, element out of it completely. If it catches your ear, it, catch, it catches your ear. Yeah. And maybe that is the pop music of, you know, 23rd, 24th century is, you know, computer-based stuff, maybe not techno or electronic as we call it, you know, today, or even think of it today, but something computer-based, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or you could go the exact opposite way, since we were on the, the hippies wanting to get away from all the, the what they consider technology killing them, um, and on this planet of Eden, yeah. uh, you'll have the people who want the classic, only human-driven 
music. Um, now, whether that that is a you know hippie with a guitar in the forest, or you know classical music, <laughs> or, or or whatever, or you know maybe uh, they just listen to a Ramones album, um, you know, and they're like this. Now this is music, and who knows between now and then, like what other you know actual human uh, made music will be relevant then, you know, who, who's the next Metallica in a hundred years? Yeah. <laughs> we, we don't know, you know, even if you're not a Metallica fan, everyone knows Metallica. Everyone knows Led Zeppelin. Who is that band in a hundred years? Yeah. That, you know, hundreds of years from then people will know, you know, so you'll, you'll have opposites of that because it, even now you have people who don't, if, if there's like auto tune in it, if it's anything, Computer based, they're turned off. They don't want to hear that, you know, beat made on made on a laptop. They don't want to hear it. Right. So it's it's personal preference, personal taste. <laughs> I just want to hear classic music like my ancestors listened to on a touch tunes jukebox. Come on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, you, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned, uh, the classical music that the characters listened to before. And, you know, obviously part of that is like, you know, the Paramount doesn't want to pay royalties to have like a popular song like on a show. But I think it's funny how CBS All Access has said, wait a minute, who cares? Of course, there are things that we find classic now that are totally going to make it to the future. We're talking about like Prince. We're talking about like David Bowie and the Beatles. Um, one of the things I found interesting this season they didn't go more into, uh, was that the, the captain on the new, um, on Picard's new ship, what's his name? Nero or no, no, not Nero. Nero's the Rios. Weird... Rios. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Rios. Um, Rios has a turntable. He has yeah. a record collection. Yeah. Why did we not go into that more? I'm sitting there every, the whole plot's moving along without me. And I'm all I can think about is I wonder what records for Andreas's record collection. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think we get too close of a look at it. Um, and I can't remember now the song that was playing when we do see it, but it was like, um, shoot, I can't remember what it was, but it was something, uh, classic, uh, right. like and a Motown it, it, type it, thing. You know, it is, it, it's a classic song, but like, what would he actually be listening to? And was it something that was handed down to him through his family? Yeah. Was it something that he, uh, is he a hipster captain that all of a sudden, well, he's you know, definitely a hipster buying, captain. <laughs> yeah. Just buying a turntable, you know, yeah. and, and it's like, Oh, I want to see what these vinyls on sale, at, uh, in free world at this, you know, at this free world Walmart is. Yeah. Right. You know, uh, does he own Purple Rain? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did uh, did the vinyl boom like continue? And are, are they still pressing vinyls? You know, in like the twenty first cent or twenty second century. Exactly. And back back to data, I was even even thinking of this, where he has everything stored in memory. Does he actually have to listen to music, or can he just recall it in his mind? That's a good question. It's so funny how Star Trek envisions like technology of the future. There's things that they kind of inspire, like flip phones and, mm -hmm. and uh, view screens and stuff. But then there's things that like they just could not even countenance. They couldn't even imagine like wireless communication if it wasn't the communicators. So every time they're going to like work on data or look at his his code, they have to plug a big cord in the back of his head. Yeah. And then every time like Captain Picard wants to listen to bizet or something like that he's got to plug a hologram disc in there like they couldn't mp3 files it's easy it's like five megabytes but for some reason they just couldn't imagine that happening so who really uh, knows when we were talking about the hippies and stuff it did make me think of one more pop culture touchstone uh reference that they did that you know if if you went into it you would have all the music that was there was on Voyager, there was the episode where the Q, you know, uh, came on there. And forgive me if I mess this up. Uh, Voyager is my favorite show, but it's been a minute since I watched this episode. <laughs> sure. The Q that wanted to die and came there, and then, you know, our Q right. uh, came there and was arguing against it. Do you remember that episode? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's the one where Riker uh, pops up for a second and everything. Yeah. While they're in that, uh, that briefing room going, you know, having the little mock trial, he brings up the dude from Woodstock. So that you went to Woodstock. They make that popular reference. Right. So they, they could have like, you know, Jimi Hendrix or anybody like that pop up. Can you use the snippet of that song? I found that very interesting. That's true. Like in the holodeck or something, just have a, yeah. a guy that looks like Hendrix. And then you wouldn't even have to play uh, Purple Haze. You could just have like a sort of sound alike riff or something like that. Right. 
they got all these, you know, historical figures through time of the holodeck plugged in. You know that there's a Woodstock program somewhere. There's got to be. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, yeah, like Quark would definitely have that in the hollow suites probably for uh, for O'Brien or somebody to be using. I could see that. J- Janeway says to Bellana, all right, Bellana, I'm going to show you my favorite my favorite concert of all time. You know, it's Janice Joplin or something. Yeah, Lilith Fair, 97. Turn it on. Exactly. <laughs> that'd be great. Hey, that'd, that'd be a good show right there, man. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder what alien music might sound like, like if aliens have a different number of fingers or hands or if they hear differently. You know, if you go by the Star Wars universe, like the Cantina band, space music sounds like Dixieland Klezmer, I guess. But yeah, I never got into the Star Star Wars uh, music, but it is, you know, it it does all kind of have that vibe to it. We do get Klingon opera, I guess. But I mean, that's like very Klingon-y. Um. I can't think. For some reason, this is how my mind works. You said uh, alien races and their music, and all of a sudden, I just pictured Ferengi loving cash money millionaires. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! There you go. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, Ferengi could get into uh, like uh, rap music, or the con- oh, conspicuous uh, late, consuming, late and rap, definitely. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Big Puff Daddy fans. <laughs> or like, you know, supposedly like, you know, Andoria is a very harsh world. It's it's very mm-hmm. cold. So I imagine like, you know, would they be like Norwegian death metal guys or, or <laughs> how that might work? I've, I've always wanted to do a little um, picture bracket. I'm not as clever as a lot of these uh, people I see online posting these things, but somehow make up like which Star Trek is which uh, musical genre or which subgenre of punk is which Star Trek is. Sure. And one thing I've al- always thought, and we even incorporated that into First Contact, uh, we use Oi's in the in the background, you know, as backup vocals mm-hmm. in our single First Contact. And part of that is, you know, Oi punk is very much a the working man's uh, music, right? Mm-hmm. You know, you get you get off work all hard uh, from a hard day's work, all day laboring. You want to go have a pint down at uh, down at the pub and uh, watch a band, right? Right. Star Trek Enterprise to me, and first contact that that whole in in world there. That's all oi. You know, that's all you know from the roots. Strap your boots up. Uh, let's go hard working. Um, and that, that's why I incorporated the oys into it, because you look at Star Trek Enterprise with their, their jumpsuits and everything. They're not flashy. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And even like, uh, you know, the, the first contact era, like the Zephyr and Cochran thing. I mean, yeah. OK. He likes Hoobie Doobie. That's cool. But like oh, he should have some punk on that jukebox. There, yeah. Magic carpet rod. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, he, he's like the 60s th- throwback guy, you know. Right. But I'm like. I'm like so, somewhere. Trip Tucker has a Dropkick Murphys uh, album on uh, his personal, you know, pad or whatever. <laughs> oh, he's got to, yeah, well, yeah. I was thinking about that when it comes to punk music. You know, which one part of it is, is you know, like pointing out the flaws in society. You'd think that the the Federation in the 24th century, like punk would be on life support because, you know, if a lot of our societal flaws are fixed, like what's punk's job? But I think it's possible that punk would be more important than ever. You know, utopia or no, there's still going to be things to call out. And I think it's really easy for people who are doing really well to become complacent politically. It's like, you know, it's like the way that Thatcherism in the UK gave rise to the original punk movement in the 70s. Mm-hmm. And if you look like now, well, you know, present day for us, I guess, would be Picard, right? Yeah. That, that's, where, that's where Starfleet is and everything. Yeah. Well, if you look at like a place like Free Cloud that they went and visited. That looked like straight up out of an 80s movie or something uh, where you'd see a guy with a mohawk over in the corner of the bar. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, and like, you know that there's some guys uh, forming a punk band talking about how uh, BS Starfleet is, you know, yeah. uh, and, you know, some, some Romulans and an angry... Uh, a uh, band all, all about how they got uh, abandoned and they should have, you know, uh, done it for themselves, you know, instead of uh, picking fights at, at bars, they're, you know, out actually being semi-political punks, <laughs> you know, right. out there doing Cause if, if we see the, the one moppy haired emo, uh, you know, Romulan, uh, <laughs> there, there's definitely some spiky haired Romulan somewhere. I promise you. Yeah. Starfleet's a bunch of fascists, you know, anarchy yeah. in the UFP. Exactly, man. <laughs> what character do you think would most likely be the uh, front man of a punk o- uh, outfit in the uh, Star Trek universe? Oh, um, 
Well, I keep going back to Trip Tucker because he's like the most everybody working man. Yeah. But um, and I could see him him doing some some fun stuff. But uh, let's talk about Chief O'Brien and uh, definitely having having like that that punk rock boy band I was talking about there. Yeah, <laughs> I could see that. Uh, any punk band use uh, bagpipes on the regular? Dropkick Murphys. Oh, that's true. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. So you can yeah, have a little yeah. vibe there. Yeah. You got Flog and Molly, Dropkick Murphys, you know, Salty Dogs, uh, all that, all that genre of Irish punk right there. Um, people just love it. it. It's popping me. I went and saw Dropkick Murphys and Rancid a couple years ago together. And while I'm a Rancid fan from way back, and that's really who I was there for, I've seen Dropkick. I like Dropkick. Dropkick Headline, you would not believe how big their crowd has gotten over. Oh, yeah. the, over <laughs> it looks, it looks like an English football game with all the flags wave, waving. You best believe Chief O'Brien be doing a cover band of that. <laughs> Trip, like Trip, could be into punk. I could see that, but he's definitely he's definitely a roots rock guy. Oh, definitely. <laughs> oh yeah, he's got a couple uh, the the band albums uh, locked away somewhere. Um. You know, I was thinking about the, the the themes of each Trek show and the way that they're all distinctive in their own right and how each theme kind of expresses something specific about its respective series. Do you have a favorite Trek theme out of all the like Trek series? Um, probably Voyager. The one that you uh, that you don't skip through on Netflix. Yes, I always list it. And you know, I'll go on record and say it now. I love the Enterprise theme. Faith of the heart. <laughs> that was my next question. <laughs> I love it. I, we, we've been, we've been, you know, kind of bantering it around that we're going to cover it at some point, make a punk version of it. And the internet's behind it. They, they, they love it. They're encouraging. Um, it's really just getting everybody on board to actually learn it and figure it out. That would be so great. Cause I mean, that's pro I mean, it's pretty soft. Uh, it's some pretty, yeah. uh, some soft rock there, but yeah, I'd love to hear a punk version of that. I mean, it, it, listen to the lyrics. It's a straight up punk song. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, I suppose that's true. Yeah. Everything's about having faith of the heart, not giving up, going, going until you can't you know, stop. Not going to change my mind. Yeah. Yeah. Not going to change my mind. No. <laughs> you know, it's, it's totally a punk song, man. We You're could selling do it. me on this. Yeah. I really like the Voyager one too. And it's like, it's, <laughs> it's actually a little excessive. Like it's so long and it's, it's just, and there's just like these, Whereas like the TNG one's got the big horns and we get it. And then like the DS9 one has some kind of sw swoopy, like moving parts. It's got like literally everything. It's like they put a gun to Jerry Goldsmith's head and it's like, you have to put every single Trek cliche into this song. But yet I just, it just gets me going. I love it so much. Now, it's funny you say that. See, I don't really think it's that long to me. Whereas the Deep Space Nine theme takes forever, it seems. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's just personal preference. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it's a well, it's a little slower tempo, and it's also you know kind of atmospheric. When you're mm -hmm. finally waiting, you know, when you're waiting for the asteroid to go by and it for, finally to start with the horns. Yeah, there's a little little bit of a wait. But you know, when you remember back to like TNG, there's the whole part where Picard's got to say the whole thing about you know the final frontier uh, before we even get through all the planets, and then the trumpets start. So there's a there's a tradition of building up but yeah i guess voyager just kind of gets right to it which is which is a good good mark for them speaking of uh deep space nine there for a second i was thinking what i said earlier about every show kind of has has a theme yeah. and if like say it, you know the original series was like old school punk rock you're going on that theme like a ramon style by the time you get to deep space nine it's definitely like the goth rock vibe <laughs> okay i can see that yeah they're like the joy division of uh star trek <laughs> <laughs> nice <laughs> uh are you watching so okay yeah you are watching disco and picard uh what do you think of their themes um i, I love both picards uh is really cool um disco i like how it how it's its own thing but then it does variations of um of the past ones yeah um you know, I'm a, I'm a big Discovery fan, man. I'm I'm a Saru guy. I love Discovery. Oh, yeah, the yeah. Music is spot on. Everything's spot on. I think. Yeah, I I like them, but I think it's interesting that they've clearly made the choice to uh, to downplay the um the theme as like an identifier for the show. Like right. I, I think they sound good, but you it's hard. You can't really go to Discovery and and find those like. Da, 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 like the horns and TNG or something. It's more of like setting a, a kind of bed for the, the the tension, you know, and the uh, the adventure on the show. So I wonder if, like, in the future, if they will ever go back to 
uh, more brass and uh, like a James Horner type thing? Um, I don't know, but I could speak to this. I know every time I watch the the 2009 movies and be you know and. Yeah and beyond that they definitely do a good job with incorporating it like the the scene where you first see uh sulu fight on top of the uh yeah Yeah. they bring up the old music cue of the fight you know right it's like oh yeah we're here now yeah yeah i think michael giacchino did a really good job with those themes and um god that guy's busy he's done soundtracks (laughs) for so many movies uh but i guess you know so did like uh jerry goldsmith back in the day too yeah um, like, I guess music now, like, and a part of it is I really think we grew up on the past stuff Yeah, and, and we know it so well, maybe, you know, the next generation that grows up with Picard and discovery will be looking fondly back at their music cues. Yeah. Um, and even though they're not using them as heavily as the other, as the other shows we were talking about, you know, it's like I said, they're good and they're definitely their, their own thing. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It, still, sort of in the kind of um, orchestral uh, kind of place that the earlier themes are, though. I wonder if we'll ever get like you know uh, a trap beat or something like that for a Star Trek <laughs> show, or if they'll ever take it somewhere else. If there was a harder punk theme for like a newer Star Trek show on CBS, uh, what do you think it would sound like? You know, what do you think it should convey? Oh boy. I don't, I don't even know. Like, uh, like they do lower decks and it's just like, screw the horns. This is just going to be a punk deal. Lower decks is totally a fun, you know, it looks like an adult swim type show. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So you can have like just a fun pop punk song. Like, like I I know the guys from Goldfinger are real big producers now. So have like maybe even a little ska in it, you know, like, like it reminds me of something like if you remember Mission Hill was a old animated show back in the day. Mm-hmm. Um, and that always had like – that was in like the late 90s, early 2000s where ska punk was in everything. Oh, we'll play some Miami Mike Boston's in Clueless because that's a thing. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so that's definitely going to be a more fun, uh, upbeat pop punk thing. That would be cool. Um I'm trying to think of like the other shows that they've got uh, coming out or, or in the works, like the Section 31 show, which if they they have to have like a like a dark uh, spy, you know, type of theme yeah. or beat to go with that. Um, I'm trying to think what the Jason Bourne soundtrack is like, but, you know, maybe oh, something yeah. like that. Um, now, now, if they do my dream show, of the Starfleet show, I've been saying for years that they need to do, um, you know, now everybody's saying that they want uh, Riker and Troy's daughter to be uh, to be the star of the uh, Starfleet show. Okay. Um, I could I could see them doing the um, my wife watches a lot of uh, teen dramas like One Tree Hill, uh, Dawson's Creek, that type of stuff. Sure. They could definitely incorporate uh, like those soundtracks had all the modern rock artists on there, you know, yeah. uh, they could definitely incorporate some fun stuff into that. Yeah. The, what's the Paula Cole of the 24th century. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> has a 24th century boy band poster on there. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. um, did, did, let me ask, I was thinking about this earlier and we circle back around to it. Uh, guys, did you ever hear the thing? I forget who was talking about somebody involved with enterprise where on enterprise, the network, one of them to every week have a different musical artist uh, playing in like the the lunch room, their version of Tin Ford, whatever it was called, the mess hall, I guess. I never heard that. This was like with the network, they wanted to just bring in like, were they, were, yeah. were they going to play like characters in, was it a hologram of like somebody or were they going to play characters? <laughs> The the, the the joke was, whenever I heard this anecdote, that they wanted them to do that. And, and the joke was that they told them, like, we're traveling away from Earth er- farther and further every week. What are we going to do? Turn back around and pick up the next boy band, boy band and bring them back? Okay. And and I can see that because – who was it at the time? UPN? Yeah, right, right. And, like, I could see that. And Buffy, what did they have? They had the bronze and there was a different band every week. That's true. You know – the, you know, even in like One Tree Hill uh, that my wife watches, I'll see like Fallout Boy pop up in an episode, or you know, Angels and Airways pop up in an episode. I can totally see some producer who doesn't really watch Star Trek being like, well, "That's what we need right there. We need that." <laughs> yeah, right. Hey, what's what's playing and, in the mess hall? Oh, I think it's some forty-one. Yeah, right. And that's exactly who it would be. <laughs> uh, I never heard. That's fascinating. Um, and, I kind of look up where that was, but I've definitely heard that before. 
I actually don't I actually don't hate it necessarily. <laughs> like one of the things that I think people criticized well, there's a lot of things they criticize about Enterprise. There's no point in going through them all. But I, something that I like about Trek now, on, like on CBS, is that they're getting a boulder, if you will. Like not every Trek show has to be uh, we're, we're seeking out new life and we're looking for stuff. I mean, I love that. And, but Trek has been that for so long. And I like the fact that we're exploring new corners of the Trek universe. And yeah, I wouldn't be opposed to that. Like if you wanted to have a show where let's just say a guy, you know, he drops out of Starfleet and he starts a band and then he's kind of like traveling around, you know, the Federation trying to do gigs and things like that. Um, and something like that could be cool. And then you can, uh, if you want to bring in your guest stars, you do it like that. <laughs> yeah. And I, uh, and speaking of the Enterprise, I was trying to think of a way they could work it. You know, they did have movie night. That's true. Um, so you, you could do concert night or whatever, I guess. <laughs> yeah, right. It's always but, always Paramount movies. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I guess in the new, um, you know, Picard, like um, Quark opens up uh, the new Quark's bar because, you know, you see in the, uh, in the episode real quick, right next to, you know, Mott's hairstyles or whatever. Right. You got Quark's bar there. And like, he just has like a different band every week as like the house band. He's always trying to uh, not pay the Latinum to. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you got a guy who's, he's, you know, living on free cloud. Uh, he's in trouble with a couple of people. He's just trying to get his band together, get moving, Sad. get some dates. And uh, those Romulans that keep messing with him <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Foz, thanks so much for talking with me today. Uh, let people know where they can find you online. All right, man. Yeah, you can find uh, Boldly Go. Uh, we're at Boldly Go Band everywhere. That's Twitter, Instagram, um, Facebook, YouTube, everywhere at Boldly Go Band. And I'm Foz Rotten. You can find me at Foz Rotten in all those same places uh, everywhere, talking Trek, uh, talking punk rock, talking movies. Um, just let's talk. We're all in uh, – quarantine so we might, might as well make the most of it right yeah, now online for sure and again you can get boldly go's debut single first contact on their Bandcamp page at boldly go and on spotify apple music and other streaming platforms thanks again thank you so much Thanks again to Foss for coming on the show to talk about music and Star Trek and his Star Trek punk band, Boldly Go. If you want to discover Boldly Go yourself, you can by going to Boldly Go Band at Bandcamp.com to hear their new single, First Contact. You can also find them on YouTube and on Twitter at, at Boldly Go Band. You can find Foz on Twitter at, at Foz Rotten. Boldly Go, of course, isn't playing any dates right now, but they are rehearsing and they sometimes put video of rehearsals and shows up on their YouTube channel at boldly go band so stay tuned to their twitter to hear when they will be touring again and catch them live and links for all of this are in the show notes if you want to know more the star trek scores the soundtracks to the films are some of my favorite cinematic pieces i like to listen to music when i write but for obvious reasons it can be tough to say bump Wu-Tang forever while I'm trying to write copy. I start writing like ODB. So to combat that, I love to listen to instrumentals and soundtracks when I work. And the Star Trek scores by composers like Jerry Goldsmith and James Horner, Michael Giacchino and others are in heavy rotation uh, on my hi-fi. I love playing James Horner's soundtrack to Wrath of Khan. I love the track Surprise Attack that underscores the attack on the Enterprise by the Reliant when they first meet. You know the one. <laughs> Then, of course, I get too excited when hearing that, and my writing starts sounding like Khan, but what can you do? You can get the expanded Wrath of Khan soundtrack on Amazon, either the physical CD, the MP3s, you can get it through streaming, or even on vinyl. I'll include an Amazon link to the soundtrack in the show notes. When you make purchases on Amazon through the links we provide, or by clicking on our shop Amazon banner on enterprisingindividuals.com to get to Amazon, a small percentage of that purchase price from your transaction comes back to us at no extra cost to you and helps keep the warp core lit here at the show. And this counts for anything you buy. It's not just Star Trek stuff. In fact, you can bookmark our banner, and when you click through to Amazon that way, whatever you buy, the same deal applies. It's a great way to help support our show. Anytime you shop on Amazon.com, click through our Amazon banner or through your bookmark or saved link and shop away. And maybe you're saying... <laughs> 
Yeah, I've already got the Wrath of Khan soundtrack and all other Star Trek music, to which I would say, do you also have rhythm and a man? Could you ask for anything more? But I would also say, if you like what you hear on Enterprising Individuals and you want to support the show, why not head to our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash E-I-S-T-P-O-D. It's there that you can sign up to be a crew member for the show and you can get access to exclusive subscriber content like our live episodes, my DS9 and Voyager rewatch recaps, extended interviews from show guests containing off-topic discussions and outtakes and more. Just head to patreon.com forward slash EIST pod. Anyone can join our crew, fans of the Gershwins or no, all are welcome at patreon.com forward slash EIST pod. And as always, the best way to support the show is to tell a friend. Anything you contribute to the show will be appreciated and will help keep us flying. Thanks. And that's it for this supplemental episode of Enterprising Individuals. If you're an Apple Podcast listener and you haven't yet, why not look us up on Apple Podcasts and make sure that you're subscribed to the show. Also, write us a little review if the spirit moves you and give us a rating at the very least. We'd appreciate it. If you're not an Apple Podcasts user, you can still subscribe to the show on Google Play or Stitcher or wherever you get our show from. And if you leave positive comments and ratings and reviews on those platforms as well, we would be eternally grateful. Next week on Enterprising Individuals. Genre fiction has had an uphill battle gaining respect in the literary world. It wasn't until 2007 that a sci-fi novel won the Pulitzer Prize, that's Cormac McCarthy's The Road, and many would quibble over its classification as sci-fi. Ray Bradbury, the 2007 recipient of a special citation by the Pulitzer Board, once said of sci-fi that, quote, Science fiction is any idea that occurs in the head and doesn't exist yet, but soon will, and will change everything for everybody, and nothing will ever be the same again, end quote. And no matter what you're writing about, be it the future, or aliens, or androids, doesn't that just describe good literature? Anyway, here's a cowboy teaching Data to play craps. Podcaster and producer Allison Pitt joins the show next week to discuss an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation that wears its genre roots on its sleeve and tries to win Baby a new pair of shoes. It's the Royale, next time on Enterprising Individuals. And until then, I'm your Captain Caliban signing off and saying live long and prosper. Hey Trekkies, I'm Caliban. And I'm Gooey Fame. And we're the hosts of the new podcast, Backtrekking. I thought that we were going to say it together. Oh, Backtrekking. <laughs> do you want to do it again? Just just don't worry about it. Every week, we look at the real-life inspirations behind classic Star Trek episodes. The original series, Next Gen, DS9, Voyager, and more. And we're examining the actual events, stories, and concepts that they're based on. Join us as we go trekking through sci-fi history. You know, we have a time machine. Let's go back and do the intro again. Hey, Trekkies, I'm Caliban. Backtracking! God damn it! <laughs>